teaching on Wednesday night about the soul of man and he did a series on the Zoe life of God and he finished it last Wednesday and I want to teach some on that and I will pick it up Wednesday night. I'm going to take the time and run a little bit with it on Wednesday night now. I won't finish this this morning but just listening to him teach he did an excellent job and I just want to put a little icing on it. You know, because, you know, really simple is that right there. I want to talk to you on the sanctification process of the soul. He talked a lot about the soul of man. And everyone's soul has to be sanctified. This is what Paul prayed, uh, wrote about in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y. And he said, I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice he said that God will sanctify you holy. And what he is speaking about, your whole spirit and soul and body. Notice that conjunction and that separates each one. So the body and the soul, they are not the same. They are closely related, related and only the word of God can separate the two. But the soul and the spirit, they are not the same. So you're a three-part being, body, soul, and spirit. We are talking about the soul. Your spirit, when you were born again, was created. God made you in his image and his likeness. Now, once you are saved, born again, it is your responsibility to do something with your soul. Now, your soul comprises of your mind, your will, and your emotion. That deals with your character. And God wants to change your character. Before you got saved, your mind was kind of, and you produced the wrong character. And your body and your spirit is warring for control or capture of the soul. Where the soul goes, so will the spirit. Where the soul goes, so will the body. If you don't do something with your soul, which is your mind, you will continue to produce carnal things. And the Bible says a carnal mind is enmity against God. It's hostile to watch the things of God. It's not even subject to the laws of God. And this is what's lacking in most of Christian life. Yes, they are saved, born again, but they didn't do anything with their soul or their mind. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Isaiah 26, 3 I will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed up on them. Romans 14, 5, that every man be persuaded in his own mind. Your mind is your soul, or your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotion. That's your responsibility, is to get into the Word of God and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And once that takes place, you're on the road to victory. Your soul has to be sanctified. And we need to learn how God will sanctify our soul because that's the road to success. If you get saved and don't enter into that sanctification process, the way you think will disqualify you to all the blessings of God. And you don't want to be a disqualified soldier. Notice that statement there on the screen. God desires to fully bless us, giving us the maximum number and the quality of rewards possible. God is a giver. He's an extravagant giver. He loves to give. His nature is to give. Satan is a taker and God is a giver. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it more in abundance. But we determine what kind of reward we will receive from God based upon how closely we walk with him and thereby obey his voice. God is limited to what he can do in the earth until he finds someone that will listen and obey. Your whole life is built around hearing and obeying. If you don't learn to obey what he says, you will disqualify yourself. Because God is limited. God has to find someone that will listen to what he has to say and someone that will obey what he said. And when he finds someone that will listen what he has to say, listen to him and obey his commands, God has found a candidate that he can promote. God will not promote you if you don't listen. 
Now, Satan knows that, so he's seeking whom he might devour. He studies our lives to find out our weakness, or he studies our lives to find out that one particular person, place, or thing that we'll walk away from God for. And once he finds it, he'll keep it in your face. Because he knows the only way to stop God's will for our lives is to get us, get us to follow things that takes us out of the will of God. Hearing and obeying is the key to your destiny. He that hears has. Watch out for anyone that will come into your life that will take you away from God. And the devil knows our weakness. He studies our life to find our weakness. And once he finds where your weakness is, you know yourself. He keep it before you. And when you come to Christ, all of us have them or had them. And God will walk you out of that. Because whether you step into what God promised you will determine how you deal with your past. And you cannot overcome your past on your own. You need the Spirit of God working with you, through you, and in you to overcome your past. It is the Holy Spirit that empowers us. He equips us, enables us to function in the earth as sons and daughters of God. No one can walk in the earth as his son or daughter of God in his own ability. It's the Spirit that enables us. It's the Spirit that quickens us. Amen? So I must go through a continual sanctification process of my soul, you must go through a continual sanctification process of your soul so that your spirit and your soul will walk in harmony to bring your body in line. But if you don't go into that sanctification process, your body and your soul, which is carnal, will take your spirit away from God or out of the will of God. And all that would do is disqualify you to the better things that God has for you. Are you there? So let's look at this word sanctification. Number one, it means to make holy, to consecrate. God is about holiness, for without holiness no man shall see God. The Bible says we are to be holy as he who has called us is holy. God wants to consecrate your soul to be used for his will. Amen? And secondly, it means to purify or to free you from your past or past sins. God has a plan to free you from your past. And if all you do is live in the past, you haven't developed your mind on the word of God. And thirdly, it means to make productive or conducive to spiritual blessing. There are things you will have to do with your soul, which is your mind or your will or your emotion, if God's going to take you there. And probably this is most Christians' biggest challenge. They got saved, but they didn't renew their mind on the Word of God. So what happened? When you don't renew your mind on the Word of God, you will have a carnal mind, or you will continue to live out your past. And if you continue to live out your past, all your past will do is disqualify you to the greater blessings. Are you out there? Now, the soul has to be sanctified for God to take you there. Yes, your spirit is born. Yes, your spirit has been recreated. Of his fullness, how we all receive. But if you don't get your soul, which is your mind, sanctified, your soul will be carnal and it'll work against you and it will disqualify you. This is what Jesus said in John 17, 17. Sanctify them through their truth. Your word is truth. That's what he was talking about, sanctifying another soul. Your spirit is recreated, made in God's name and his likeness. But you got to do something with your soul, which is your mind. And the only way you can do it is through the word of God. Now, I'm trying to learn something. I'm having a hard time, but I'm going to do it today. I'm trying to learn how to preach a 30-minute sermon. Because I, when I got saved, the people that taught me, man, they preach an hour, hour and a half, and it's in my blood to preach an hour. And I'm trying my best to learn how to preach a half an hour sermon because this 21st century crowd, you can't hold them long. And I try to give you guys too much. So pray for me that I can do this in a half an hour. I'll get there because my wife keeps reminding me what I don't go do it. But it's a process because I learned from those guys, Brother Copeland, man, it ain't nothing for him to preach two hours. Dad Hagen, even Bishop Hatch, my dad, they went an hour, and I'm trying my best to undo <laughs> what my teachers taught me so I can hold your attention for half an hour, amen? Pray for me, I'll get there, amen? So now I'm going to run you through the Bible. Get the DVD or the CD from what I'm going to talk about because you need it here in Genesis 2, 7. Now in Genesis 1, 26, the Bible says God made man in his image and his likeness, and the likeness of God made he... Male and female. He made us like him. 
We are made in God's image and likeness. He was speaking about our spirit, not your physical body. Our spirit, is, God is a spirit. And our spirit is made in his image and his likeness. And after God gave that command, notice there in Genesis 2, verse number 7, he said, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And notice that Buddha there, man became a living soul. He became like God. See, man had not known evil. Man did not know sin because God, man came out of God. God duplicated himself and made a man in his image and his likeness. Do you not know Adam had the mind of God? Now, this is what we got to learn. Adam was created whole. Jesus was born whole. When we get saved, we have to be made whole. And the only way that we can be made whole is through the word of God. When you get saved, that's the purpose of getting in the word, so God can make you whole. Paul prayed that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless to the coming of the Lord. That's a process. That never stops. Amen? So what we got to learn is when God breathed into Adam's nostril the breath of life, he became a living soul like God. Matter of fact, Adam had the mind of God. God created everything and Adam gave it a name. Adam named everything God created. Why? Because he and God was one. He came out of God. He had the mind of God. But you know the story in Genesis 3, they were out in the garden one day and Salem came along and started communicating with Adam's wife. After God created the woman, he started communicating with Adam's wife Eve. And he deceived Eve to take of the forbidden fruit. And what happened? Adam was there, but his wife seduced him to obey her commands over God. So the woman was deceived and the man was seduced. That's all danger when you promote even your wife's words over God. As much as we love our wives, but at no time should we allow their words to be greater than God's word. And as a result, the curse came when Adam disobeyed the commands of God. You know the story. Man became so evil in his ways. Notice, fast forward to Genesis 6, verse number 3, and the Lord God said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. All of a sudden, this God, man that God made in his image and likeness, spirit, his flesh got involved. Man became flesh. Sin took over his life. Notice what God said, yet this day shall be 120 years. That's God's plan for us to live 120 years. That's God's plan that everyone live 120 years, but the wages of sin is dim. Now, Adam had so much of the life of God on the inside of him, it took Satan 930 years to teach him how to die. But you can see how far we have come from 930 years to Proverbs 70 of 80 years. Sin will kill you because the Bible says the soul that sin is shall die. The wages of sin is death. We went from 930 years full of life to around about 70 of 80 years. And if you sin, you're dying spiritually, but it also works on you physically. So much for that. Man became flesh. Flesh took over man's life. Notice there in verse number five, that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent, every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. Man after man sinned, the devil just harassed that man and took over his life. And the flesh was the dominant force in his life. Even today, your flesh and your spirit is always war for control of the soul, or capture of the soul. And this man became so evil in his imaginations and his thoughts and his intent. Continually, Satan was filling that man with evil thoughts. He'll do us like that. If you don't have some fight in you, he'll continually feed your mind or your soul with evil thoughts, evil imagination, evil intention. And if you don't fight them things off, or you wonder why I keep thinking like that, there's no fight in you. And notice what happened in verse 6. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth in his image and likeness. And he was grieved in his heart because the creature that he made to be like him became so evil, so far away from God, that God was grieved that he made man. See, God has always wanted a family. God's a father. Every father wants a family. 
God created Adam and Eve to produce a family. But the devil took that family from God. But God made a plan to bring that family back to him. That we will fellowship with him. And then faster. And then notice that bullet there. Every imagination, every thought of man became evil before God. And God was so grieved that he made a creature like him. So grieved that the one he made in his image and likeness has lost everything he put in him. And he's grieved even today when we take on things that's not like him. Because God wants a relationship with everybody. So therefore, we're going to fast forward to Isaiah 53. Let me say something about God. Anything God's going to do in the earth, he'll find someone to communicate it in words before it happens. And here in Isaiah, Isaiah by the Spirit is prophesying of the coming of the Lord. Isaiah 53 verses 10 through 12. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul, Jesus' soul, an offering for sin. Jesus, someone had to pay the penalty for the sins of the world. And notice he's dealing with the soul. In Genesis 2, 7, he breathed in his mouth of the breath of life and he became a living soul. So now here is God going to raise up Jesus to pay the penalty for the sins of the world. And Jesus made his soul as an offering. Isn't that powerful? He shall see his seed. God will see Jesus on the cross. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. God had pleasure when Jesus chose to go on the cross to pay the penalty for the sins of the world. Because someone had to pay the penalty for Adam's sin. And Jesus chose to be that person. Notice verse 11. And he shall see the labor of his soul. And be satisfied by his knowledge my righteous servant, talking about Jesus, shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Jesus bore yours of my sins and our transgressions and our iniquities on the cross. Verse 12. He said, therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the strong. Well, because he, Jesus, poured out his soul unto death when he was on the cross. And he was numbered with the transgressors. He was numbered and he bore the sins of many. And he made intercession for even the transgressors. This is what Jesus did. God prophesied about what he's going to do before it happened. Because God always declares the end at the beginning. Anything God's going to do, he'll find someone that will hear what he said and communicate what he said. And in due time, at God's appointed time, he'll make it become a reality in life. He does it with us. Notice that bullet. It was God's pleasure to put his son on the cross. The devil thought he had captured the Lord of glory, but God was in the background laughing, setting the devil up. And they ever thought he could stop you, but God is in the black background laughing. When your faith make that divine connection, can't no devil stop you. Because the Bible says, if God is for us, who can be against us? For greater is he that is in us and he that is in the world. That's why you have to keep your heart right. Because the Bible says, the pure in heart shall see God. And then notice that second bullet, Jesus poured out his soul unto death when he was upon the cross. And let's fast forward to the New Testament and look at Matthew, the 26th chapter. This is actually what Isaiah was saying. There in Isaiah, in his day, this is what Isaiah was saying about what's going to take place when Jesus comes. In Isaiah 53, now here in Matthew 26, after Jesus came into the earth and it's time for Jesus to go to the cross. Notice what Jesus said there in verse 36, Matthew 26, 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And said to the disciples, Sir, sit here while I go and pray over there. Even Jesus had to pray to fulfill the will of God. Don't ever think you can get by without praying. For Jesus said in Luke 18, 1, If people don't pray, they will turn coward or they will faint in their mind. Hebrews 12, 3 says, You will faint in your mind. If you're not a person of prayer, I would encourage you, sir, a man, to become a student of prayer because God's will would not be carried out if you don't mix it with prayer. Prayer empowers us, equips us to say no to the devil. People that don't pray will turn coward to the devil. You have no fight in you. That's one reason why I make prayer a priority. If Jesus had to pray to carry out God's will, don't ever think that you can come into this earth and make it 
without praying. And the Bible says, we'll always pray with not faint. Praying always with all prayers and supplication in the Spirit. Thank God that this is a praying church. And if you haven't joined us in prayer, I would encourage you to come out here and pray with us. We matter the fact we're getting ready to go in three days of fast. I'll be out here every night. It would be good to see your face. At least one night. And notice that next verse right there, verse 37. And he took with him Peter, James, and John, the two sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful, deeply distressed. distressed. In verse 38, notice what Jesus said to Peter, James, and John. Then he said to them, he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Remember Isaiah said he poured out his soul unto death. He prophesied. Now here's Jesus saying to Peter, James, and John. He said, man, this thing is on me. The weight of the world is upon me. And God has asked me to go to the cross to pay the penalty for the sins of the world. That's where the devil kept attack you. He attack your mind. He attack your soul. If your soul, if your mind is not strong, as my son taught you, if you're not strong in the Lord and in the power of might, you'll quit, you'll faint, and you'll throw in the tower. And all you will do is disqualify yourself from all of the blessings that God has for you. And the devil attacked Jesus because he wanted Jesus to quit throw in the towel. He'll attack you. He'll attack you. If you haven't been attacked by the devil, hang around here. He's coming. Because he wants you to quit. Because if you quit and give in to the flesh, you'll disqualify yourself to see the glory of the Lord. Jesus prayed himself through. He prayed for one hour. And he came back. And the Peter, James, and John fell asleep. And he woke him up and went back and prayed again. And he came back and he said, could you guys watch with me one hour? That's where I got that one hour of prayer from. Because in Acts, the third chapter, the Bible said, Peter, James, and John, they went to the temple for the hour of prayer. They learned from Jesus the importance of that hour of prayer. We pray for one hour because God established the order through Jesus that men should always pray and not think. And then he said, he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's your greatest challenge to where God's going to take you is your flesh. And if your spirit is not stronger than your flesh, your flesh will take you places that you, God told you not to go. Your flesh will have you doing things that God told you not to do. Don't let your flesh take over your life. Paul said, in my flesh dwelleth no, your flesh didn't get saved. No, your body is not saved. Like my son said, if you're black, when you got saved, you're going to still be black. If you're white, if you got a bald head, whatever you are, that didn't get saved. I looked at my hands and they looked new. I looked at my feet and they did too. My son said, if you got bunions on your feet when you get saved, they didn't leave. And that is true. See, God doesn't deal with the flesh. That's your job. God deals with your spirit. He builds your spirit. That's your job to deal with your soul, empowering your soul, strengthen your souls that you may tell your flesh. You can't do that. There's a lot of things my flesh won't, but I know I can't do it because all it would do is disqualify me. Yes, I see things out there. There's a lot of things my flesh say I want some of that, but I tell my flesh you can't have that. Yeah, because all I know it would do is disqualify me. And I'm not going to be like Esau, sell my vision for a mess of pottage. I'm not going to be like Esau to give up what God has for me for five or ten minutes of pleasure. Ten minutes of pleasure is not worth the destiny that God's going to take you. And you had to grow to that place. And then he said, man, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. He said, stay here and watch with me. You know, they fell asleep again. But he prayed three different times. He prayed the hour. And the Bible said each time he said the same thing. So much for that. But see, all of this happened. And Jesus did all of that for us on the cross. He gave his soul as an offering for our sin. Now, he dealt with the soul. That's what he dealt with. He dealt with the soul on that cross. Now, in Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, God is prophesying again about what's going to happen once we get our soul in order. Or once we are born again. Notice what he said there in Jeremiah 31 verse 14. He said, I will saturate the soul of the priest. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 5, for we are all kings and priests 
Everyone who is a Christian, you are a priest, and Jesus is our high priest. And here is God say, after the new birth, he will saturate the soul of the priest with abundance. And my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, said the Lord. These are the things that will happen once you get into the word and renew your mind on the word and fill your soul up with the word. See, when your soul was saturated with the abundance of his word, his will, and his way, God said good things will begin to happen. Because all of that does is deal with your character. It's the devil that wants you to chase a rabbit that's going to take you out of the right way. Because he knows all he's going to do is disqualify you. But God said, tell your neighbor, God said, he will saturate the soul of the priest. He's talking about me, Chris. He's talking about you. He's talking about us. He said, I will saturate the soul of the priest with abundance. Jesus said, I come that you may have life and that you may have it more in abundance. So I know what God wants with me. I got to do something with my soul. I got to get rid of that empty head and fill it with the word. And when I know that the word is in charge of my life, his word is leading me and I will follow his will and I will do his way. And God said, he will saturate me with abundance. But he didn't stop there. Boy, I like this. Notice what he said. My people shall be satisfied with the goodness of the Lord. Amen. That's God talking to you and I. But I like what he said. He prophesied again about the soul in Lamentation 3, verse number 17. Notice what he said there. He said, you have moved my soul from peace. When the Bible and the Hebrew think about, talk about peace, that word peace means prosperity if you study it. He said, you have moved my soul from prosperity or peace. I will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed up on me. And notice what he said when he lost his peace. He forgot about prosperity. See, Satan, say, Satan wanted you to become carnal-minded. Taking your mind away from God. I will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is it stayed up on me. Follow peace with all men. So God is a God of peace. That peace represents prosperity. Because when you have the peace of God, you make good decisions. See, my people, my soul, you have moved my soul from peace. And when that happened, you forgot about prosperity. The effect of an empty soul is what? No peace, no prosperity, no strength, no hope. But notice what he stated there in verse, that next verse. And I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. When his soul was removed from God, he became another man. If you don't do something with your soul, you have no strength, no hope, no peace, and even no prosperity. Notice what he stated in verse 25. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Seek ye the Lord why he might be found. Call upon him while he is near. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Let's go into the New Testament. Fast forward a few minutes. Being born again, God's sanctification process. When you come to Christ, you were born through the wound of your mother. You were born into, born into sin, shapen and iniquity. Every person who comes to God has to be born again. Your spirit is recreated. Your spirit is reborn. Then it's your responsibility to get into the word and renew your mind on the word of God. And I'm going to teach you how God would do that. Notice here in 1 Peter 1 verses 2, he's talking to the elect. That's the church. The elect, the church, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. To know before it is known. That's what foreknowledge is. It's to know that, see, God's know things before it happens. See, foreknowledge is you know before it is known. You know things before others know it. And he'll give us his word to tell us the end at the beginning. And you know what the end's going to be if you stay in the spirit. Amen? So notice what he stated there. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. How? In the sanctification 
of the Spirit. How? For obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Notice what happened. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. How do God multiply grace? How do, which is God's favor. How do God multiply peace when we obey his commands? Notice that bullet. When you obey the sanctification of the Spirit comes for what? Obedience. This is how God sanctifies us for the work which he's called us unto. This is how God prepare you for where he's going to take you. The sanctification takes place in your soul. It does. It deals with your soul. Your spirit is recreated. Your spirit is born again, made in God's image and likeness. But it's your soul. But notice what else is happening. He said the sprinkling of the blood. See, when we obey, when we listen and obey, the blood goes to work. And what happened? Once the blood finished its work in you, the blood frees you from your path. There is a cleansing taking place out of obedience to God's commands that takes place in the soul. And when God is satisfied with that cleansing process, remember John 15, 3, you are clean through the words I've spoken unto you. God is forever looking for people that will hear and obey. Second Chronicles 16, 9, say the eyes of the Lord runs to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose heart is perfect or committed to him. So when I obey God's word, Behind the scene, a purging is taking place. He's purging my conscience from dead work. He's cleansing me, preparing me, because see, God's going to set you apart, because that's what sanctification does. It sets you apart. It consecrates your heart. It consecrates your soul. It consecrates your mind to be used of God later. He deals with your character, because before Christ, your character was crazy, man, but after you're born again, being born again, not of the corrupted seed, but of the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It's the word working in me. And when I obey that word, a purging is taking place and God is equipping me and qualifying me for what's going to happen later. Grace and peace comes. It's multiplied out of obedience. Obedience, God, looking for people that will hear and obey his command. And see, when it happens, and when God finds that, he'll promote you, Robert, above the fellows. He'll promote you above the family. He'll promote you above the friend. That's what God is looking for. People that will hear and obey and do what he has to say. Because, see, you represent God. And he said, when God is for you, who can be against you? He said, he will anoint you above the fellows. Hebrews 1, 7. He said, he will anoint you above the fellows when you learn to hear and obey what God has to say. When you don't obey, you disqualify yourself to the inheritance that God gave you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Help us, Jesus. Now let's look at it. The next phase of this. The enduring word. Everything God would do, he starts with his word. He sent his word and healed us and delivered us from our destruction. Amen. Notice here in James, James was the brother of Jesus. In James 1, verse number 21 and 22, he said, Therefore lay aside, this is God's cleansing process, all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted, the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. So now he said, quit doing what you did in the past. And receive with meekness the implanted, the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Now in Psalms 23, David said, restore my soul. Because his soul couldn't be restored because David had a sinful nature. Jesus had to come and pay the penalty for the sins of the world for David's soul to be restored. But now here is James writing after the cross saying the soul can be saved. See, when you get into the word of God and become a doer of God's word, what happened? The word started working and take your soul back to his original place that God created in Genesis 2, 7 when he created Adam and Adam became a living soul. You know what's lacking in most people's lives? They have not been renewed on the word of God. And when your mind is not renewed on the word of God, although you were saved, you will continue to live out your old life. Hallelujah. Receive with meekness the implanted, the engrafted word that is able to save 
your soul. If you don't do something with your soul, your flesh will disqualify you for some of the greatest blessings that God has for you. Help us. Help us, Jesus. Help us. And then notice the next verse. He said, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving yourself. When you hear the word and don't become a doer of what you hear, you're living under deception. You have a lot of them right here today that's living under deception. Because they know to do right, but they refuse to do it. They know they should forgive, but they won't. And they're still holding on to someone else's error. And you take on someone else's sin when you won't forgive. They know they shouldn't be doing this and that, but they still do it. Why? When you do things that God tells you not to do, your flesh is stronger than your spirit. Your flesh is controlling your destiny. And Paul said, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Man, your flesh is crazy. Your flesh doesn't get saved. When you sin, that's your flesh. When you do right, that's your spirit. And we all have missed the mark. But you can't stay there. You have to repent. And see, that's what grief, it doesn't really bother God. Sin, God hates sin. But really what grieves God is when we practice it. And you can repent or you can feel sorrow and say, well, I'm sorry. But if you don't change your ways, if you don't change your path, you may have to cut off a few people for a while. Because if you think you can continue to sin and be blessed, you're living under deception. Now, God will forgive sin, but he will not reward it. God looks for hearers and doers of his word. And when he finds a hearer and a doer of his word, he immediately starts a cleansing process. Because he's going to set you apart from all of your family, all of your friends, all of the fellows that you knew before you got saved. Because God's going to promote you because he's found someone that will listen and obey. Amen? Amen. And then notice here in 1 Peter 1, verse 22 and 23, he said, this is how he would do it. Seeing you have purified your soul. Purified your soul. Your soul has to be purified. How does he purify your soul? In obeying the truth through the Spirit. In sincere love of brethren, Love one another fervently with a pure heart, for the pure in heart shall see God. Verse 23, haven't been born again, of being born again, not of the corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God, which liveth and abides forever. Every Christian has been born again. You were born through the word. That's why you have to spend time in that word and feed on the word. Notice what happened there in that bullet. Purified. Your soul, how? In obeying the truth through the Spirit. When you obey the truth, which is God's Word, a cleansing process is going to place in your life. God is purging you, purging your conscience. That's what the truth will do. When you obey God's Word, God is purging your conscience from dead works. He's dealing with things down on the inside of you, things you got exposed to when you were 10, things you got exposed to when you were 11, things you got exposed to that you forgot about, but they still land dormant down in your spirit. And see, that's what this Word would do, because the Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God can separate the joints, the marrows of the bone or whatever. The Word of God even studies the intents of the heart. God's Word, get down on the inside of you and he started a cleansing process and somewhere in this walk you wake up and say good God Almighty look what the Lord has done and you begin to think what you were and you begin to see who you are and you have to say look what the Lord has done so it happens like this this is the way it happened God has blessed you and I but I didn't start out right here where I am no I didn't start out it's a process Sanctification is a process, and you start the moment you begin to believe. And as you continue to obey the word, continue to do the word, God will take you there. Because see, what happens in the sanctification process, God sets you apart. 
He sets you apart from anything that's in the flesh. God is equipping you. He's molding you because he's the potter and I am the clay. There are some areas in your life God wants to get free from. He may free you up from some people in your life because when you get around certain people, you find yourself doing things that you know you shouldn't do. So God say, I got to get down on the inside of you and get a hold to that urge to do wrong. I got to get down on the inside of you and deal with the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The devil has slipped down into your life and he's hiding down there. He's hiding in something that happened when you were 12 years old. He's hiding down there of something that happened when you were 13 years old. You were molested and it's still bugging you. But I'm going to go down there and I'm going to dig that damn out of you. I'm going to get all of that hell out of you. I'm going to get all of that damn out of of you. Only God knows. Only God knows. Only God knows what's in my character. Only God knows. I have a, I have a little knowledge of it, but God knows things that I don't know. He knows the moment that, that sin was conceived. He knows the moment, and he knows the person who brought it to you, and you've been struggling with your life. You've been struggling with your past. But when Jesus came, God, God Almighty, Oh, good God Almighty. When Jesus came, he knows how to get down into the marrow. He said, I will deal with the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Because he said, I got a plan for you. He said, I know the plans, dinners I have for you. I know the thoughts I think towards you. Thoughts of peace and not evil to give you an expected end. And God said, yeah, there are some things in your character that would disqualify you. That's the first thing God's gonna deal with is those character flaws. Things that you don't pay a whole lot of attention to, but God said they'll disqualify you later. So I'm gonna deal with in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. God will take his word and that word is full of the blood of Jesus. That word is full of the spirit of God. That word is full of the power of God. And when you reject the word, you disqualify yourself to all the things that God has for you. Oh, this, I suppose they have a half an hour sermon, wasn't it? Oh, good God Almighty. See, God deals with the soul. Never mind the flesh. It's the soul that God wants to renew. It's the soul that God wants to restore. It's the soul that God wants to save. And when you obey God's word, that's what he's dealing with. Because there's something he has for you. Yes. Notice in this scripture right there, 3 John, verse 2. He said, Beloved, I pray, I wish that, that you may prosper in all things. Here's God talking. Say, God said, this is my will for you, that you prosper in all things. In everything you do, God wants you to succeed. But also, he said, he wants you to be healthy. Prosperity and health is God's number one will for your life. He said, I place that above everything. If you'll be honest, Satan probably attack you more in those two areas. He probably fights you more in those two areas. Your needs being met, having enough, and your body being whole. But notice what God said. These things would take as your soul. So the state of my mind, the state of my soul, my character has a lot to do with where God's going to take me. You can't disqualify yourself if you don't honor, enter into God's sanctification process. Notice in verse 3, he said, For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, as you walk in the truth, verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them through that truth. That word is truth. Now, this is what you got to learn. I'm still being sanctified. Because that's a lifetime process. But I have to admit, I'm not where I was when I first got saved. And if you continue to walk with God and obey his word, God will finish that process. And somewhere only God knows when I am qualified for the blessing. But God won't take your places your character can't keep you. And God won't put you around people that your character can't sustain you. So tell your neighbor, don't disqualify yourself. 
because we're, we're on the road to success. I know I'm on that road. And I know there are things in my life that God's going to deal with. And I have to make a decision. Do I love this more than I love God? Or whether I'd rather just stay right here for a while and go on to the next level? Because the Bible says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for them that love him. But he revealed those things unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. God's greatest joy is when he sees us walking after truth, because the truth will set you free. In the world, you have two spirits. You have the spirit of error, and you have the spirit of truth. The church should be operating under the spirit of truth. How do we operate under the spirit of truth? By operating under the word. Because God's word is truth. The people of the world, the spirit of error. They don't know God. You can expect them to act like that, to talk like that, to do things. But you and I, we're saved. And this is what it comes down to. It all goes back to fellowship. Notice that bullet, as the soul prospers. I, don't, I will pick this up Wednesday night, but I'm just going to give you a taste of it right now. That's the soul prophet. Remember the scripture I gave you in Lamentation 3.25? The soul that seek him shall prosper, be satisfied with God's goodness. Fellowship is the key. Remember Genesis 2.7, God breathed in Adam's nostril, the breath of life, and he became a living soul, a living soul like God. God wanted a family for fellowship. That's what man was created for, fellowship. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him now, in spirit and in truth. Philippians 3.3, 3, we are the circumcision of the people who worship God in the spirit, who rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. And you need to learn this right here. And I picked this up Wednesday night. In this fellowship, we fellowship with the Father through prayer. God the Father, God, we have the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. This is how you fellowship with the Father. It's through prayer. Remember what Paul said in John 16, Jesus said in John 16, 23, he said, in that day, he said, you will ask me nothing, but whatever you ask the Father in my name, I will do it. This is what Jesus said in John 16, 23. He said, in this day, this day we're living in, he said, you don't ask me nothing. He said, whatever you ask the Father in my name. Remember what Paul said when he was praying in Ephesians 3, 14? For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whom the whole family in heaven and earth are named, that he will strengthen us with might by his spirit in the enemy. When we pray, we pray to the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Prayer is fellowship and with the Father. How do we fellowship with Jesus? When you read the word, you are fellowshipping with Jesus. Remember what he said in John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask the Father what you will and it shall be done. But how do we fellowship with the Holy Spirit? Romans 8, for as many that are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. We fellowship with the Holy Spirit when we yield to the will of God. He has been assigned to lead us and to guide us into all manner of truth. Fellowship with the Father through prayer. Fellowship with the Son by reading the Word, meditating the Word, and doing the Word. And fellowship with the Holy Spirit when we yield to His leading. we we'll pick this up next week. You gotta yield to the Spirit. They work together.